at the parables of Ezekiel, and uh, we are looking at the parable today of the shipwreck, the parable of the shipwreck, and you'll see that as we go along. Let's pick up our reading in verse 1 of chapter 27 of Ezekiel, where the prophet writes, "'The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, "'Now, thou son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyrus, "'and say unto Tyrus, O thou that art situate at the entry of the sea, "'which art a merchant of the people for many isles, "'thus saith the Lord God, O Tyrus, thou hast said, "'I am of perfect beauty.'" Thy borders are in the midst of the seas. Thy builders have perfected thy beauty. They have made all thy shipboards of fir trees of Sinir. They have taken cedars from Lebanon to make masts for thee. Of the oaks of Bashan have they made thine oars. The company of the Asherites have made the benches of ivory brought out of the isles of Kittim. Fine linen with broidered work from Egypt was that which thou spreadest forth to be thy seal. Blue and purple from the isles of Elisha was that which covered thee. The inhabitants of Zidon and Arvad were thy mariners. Thy wise men, O Taras, that were in, Taras were, that were in thee, were thy pilots. The ancients of Gebal and the wise men thereof were in thee, and thy caulkers all the ships of the sea with their mariners were in thee to occupy thy merchandise. They of Persia and of Lud and of Foot were in thine army, thy men of war. They hanged the shield and helmet in thee. They set forth thy comeliness. The men of Arvad with thine army were upon thy walls round about, and the Gamadims were in thy towers. They hang their shields upon thy walls round about. They have made thy beauty perfect. And then if you go down to verse 25 of the chapter, verse 25, it says, The ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market, and thou wast replenished, and made very glorious in the midst of the seas. Thy roars have brought thee into great waters, the east wind hath broken thee in the midst of the seas. Thy riches and thy fares, thy merchandise, thy mariners and thy pilots, thy caulkers and the occupiers of thy merchandise, and all thy men of war that are in thee, and in all thy company which is in the midst of thee, shall fall into the midst of the sea in the day of thy ruin. And we trust the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. In the late 16th century, relations between Catholic Spain and Protestant England had been souring, eventually leading to the outbreak of the Anglo-Spanish uh, uh, Anglo War in 1585. Events were then brought to a head uh, by a further support of the English of the Dutch Protestant United Provinces, which historically go on to form the Netherlands. And this support excited King Philip II of Spain to plan an invasion of England. So on the 29th of July, 1587, he obtained papal authority to overthrow Queen Elizabeth I and replace her with whomsoever he chose. So an armada, a battle fleet, was prepared to invade England to defeat her armies and to depose Queen Elizabeth I. That fleet consisted of 130 ships, 8,000 soldiers, 18,000, or 8,000 sailors rather, 18,000 soldiers, 1,500 brass guns, 1,000 iron guns, and it was termed the great and most fortunate navy. Well, we know what happened, don't we? The Armada was subsequently defeated by the English and attempted to return to Spain by going around the coastland of Ireland and up through northern Scotland, and they ran into trouble when they steered headlong into a terrible hurricane. Already in poor condition after battle at sea, many of the Spanish ships were sunk, 
and many others were pushed into the sandbanks and rocks off the Irish coast and wrecked. Philip's plans to invade England had been effectively quashed. And of course, the weather had played a large part in that because the Spanish were now effectively without a navy. And so that unlikely victory was viewed at the time as proof positive of God's support for Protestantism against Catholicism. And so the churches rang their bells and there were thanksgiving services up and down the land and a number of medals were struck to commemorate the occasion. And one of those medals famously recorded the words, God blew and they were scattered. God blew and they were scattered. Well, in our parable from Ezekiel this morning, we see a very similar event, not upon warships, but upon a merchant ship that is the pride of the seas. In this parable, the city of Tyre is portrayed as a beautiful ship which is steered off course and into an eastern wind to its destruction, a picture of the sure judgment of God. Now, if we learn anything from this parable this morning, it is the folly of materialism. You know, we live in a world that is really marked by consumerism and sold out to materialism. Never has there been, I think, in the history of our nation, a generation that has owned so much of this world's goods and yet is so desperately unhappy. We do well if we learn then from the parable of the shipwreck. Now, if you recall last week, as we looked into chapter 24, I said to you that at this point in the book of Ezekiel, God was finished with his judgment of Judah and that the book was then moving into the judgment of the Gentile nations. And so in chapter 5, and uh, we, if you took the time to go back there, chapter 25, I should say, if you took the time to go back there, uh, you can read his sentence upon a variety of Gentile peoples. But then you come to chapters 26, 27, and 28. And chapters 26, 27, and 28 focus particularly upon the prosperous city of Tyre. Now, Tyre was the capital of the global economy in ancient times. She traded with the wider world. And many, many thousands of people all over the world at that time relied upon trade with the city of Tyre. The city prided herself not only in her great wealth, but upon her fortress uh, position as, a, as an island city. Uh, they saw themselves as having impregnability. And uh, indeed, as I mentioned, it was a fortress city. There was an island part of the city, and there was an inland part of the city, a coastal part to this city that was located in Phoenicia, which is now modern Lebanon. And so both parts of the city were formidable. Uh, they were financially secure. They were politically free. They were militarily strong. And so really what you're looking at here is one of the strongest cities of the ancient world. And with its seafaring traditions, Tyre became known as Babylon of the sea. So if the Babylon was imperial on land, Tyre was imperial on the waves. Tyre was the nation at that time who ruled the waves. So in chapter 26, God pronounces his sentence upon Tyre in one of the most remarkable prophecies in all the word of God. In that chapter, you read how that many nations would come against Tyre. You read how the inhabitants of the villages and towns of Tyre would be slain. You read how that Nebuchadnezzar would build a siege mound against this city inland, that the city would be broken down with stones and timber and soil thrown into the midst of the sea. And then you read how the city would become a place for spreading nets. In Isaiah chapter 23, there's further details on this prophecy. 
But all of this came to pass. Over the course of time, of course, Nebuchadnezzar comes and he seeks to besiege the inland city. He defeats it, uh, but he can't reach the island city. He's struggling to overcome the island city. And after a protracted campaign, he withdraws his troops and leaves the island city in place. But 250 years later, just as God uh, prophesied, uh, Alexander the Great comes. He takes the debris from the fall of the coastal city and he throws it into the sea and he makes a causeway all the way out to the island city. And to cut a long story short, he conquers the island city. And of course, even to this day, that causeway is used by fishermen in the region for the spreading of nets, for the drying of their nets. So this was a remarkable prophecy. Hundreds of years in advance, God foretold what would happen to the ancient city of Tyre. In chapter 28, you then have a kind of different view of things, and you see the power behind Tyre. You find out that the one who is really pulling the strings on the, uh, on the reign of that particular city is none other than Satan himself. And sometimes we forget that. We forget that Satan is behind personalities who are powerful and who are political figures and who carry great, great cloud in this world. And we sometimes make that individual, that person that we see, the focus of our antipathy and, and anger and rage at some of the things they say and do. But understand that, that this world is given over to Satan. And Satan is very often the one who is behind the political figure that you see on your TV screen. So this brings us to chapter 27. <clears throat> chapter 27 is wedged, obviously, between chapters 26 and 28. And here we have a, a parable. So you have a prophecy in chapter 26. You have a power in chapter 28. And you have a parable in chapter 27. And this parable is the focus of our attention this morning. Notice that this parable speaks of the splendor of Tyre in verses 1 through 11, the early part of our reading. And you'll notice in verse 2 that Ezekiel is told to take up a lament, a lamentation against Tyrus or for Tyrus. In other words, he's called upon to present a funeral dirge. Now, this was often the way that prophets in ancient times would, uh, would present the truth against a particular uh, city if it was going to fall or a particular nation if it was going to fall. They would basically sing a funeral song and they'd say, it's curtains for you. Your time is up. Your death is now looming and your funeral is at hand. Now, if you were to cast a, an eye over this chapter, one word comes up time and time again, and that's the word merchant. You'll read over and over again the word merchant or merchants or merchandise. In fact, 22 times that word or those words appear in this particular text. In verse 3, we read that Tyre was a merchant of the people for many isles. In Isaiah 23 and verse 3, we're told she is a mart of the nations. A mart, literally a trade center for the nations. That's what she was. She was the heart of a global economy. If we were to liken her to modern times, we would place her alongside great cities like Shanghai or London or New York and see her as this global center from which world trade was taking place. Now, this city loved herself. You know, she really, really played on her position in the world economy of the ancient world. And notice her proud boast in verse, uh, verse 3. The Lord says that she has said, I am of perfect beauty. Now, that boast is an offense to God. Why is it an offense to God? Because that claim to be of perfect beauty is an accolade that belongs to the holy city. It belongs to the city of Jerusalem. In Psalms chapter 48 and verse 2, the Lord says of Jerusalem that she is beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. But the thing that made Jerusalem beautiful, 
wasn't her architectural grandeur. It wasn't that she was spectacular in that way, although her temple was certainly a wonder of the ancient world. But by, by this time, it's not the case that she is, you know, is one of the grandest cities in the world. But here's the thing that makes her beauty, uh, makes her beautiful. It's the presence of God within her. The psalmist again says, out of Zion, out of Jerusalem, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Isn't that a lovely verse? Out of Jerusalem, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. You know, in a world that places so much emphasis on external beauty and on cosmetic uh, appearances, this is a great truth to remember, that real beauty is on the inside. And there is no greater beauty than when Christ is shining out from the inside of a person, when others can see the indwelling Christ in us. So this city then is likened to a great merchant vessel. And being a seafaring people, the Tyrians spent a great deal of time and money uh, beautifying their ships and, and making their mark as they traveled the, the oceans of the world. And so God pictures the city itself as a beautiful ship. He takes an imagery that the people of Tyre would have been familiar with, this great sailing vessel, and he says, well, let me paint your city as a great sailing vessel. Let me paint your city as a magnificent ship. And so he describes the decks, and he describes the sails and the banners. He describes the masts and the oars, and they're all constructed from the very best materials that this world has to offer. And notice, too, the nations that are mentioned in the manufacture and provision of these things. Lebanon, uh, Bashan, Israel, uh, Egypt, the islands of the Mediterranean, the isles of Katim, likely Cyprus and Crete. Not only was this good ship provided for with the best of materials, but it was manned by an international crew. You know, as you can imagine, the great cities of the world today, the Shanghais, the New Yorks, the, the, um, the Londons, draw people in from all over the world who service the financial sector. And so it was with ancient Tyre. People realized there was money to be made in this city. They realized that there was a good life to be had in this city. They realized that they could prosper in this city, unlike their native towns and villages and cities. And so people came from afar to be part of all that was going on in Tyre. And so we have some other uh, towns that are mentioned and places that are mentioned. Uh, they have Persia and of Lud and of Foot. Uh, Lud is probably Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopia foot is uh, Libya. Now, these men joined the army of the Tyrians. And notice that as soldiers, in verse 10, they hanged the shield and the helmet in thee. What does that mean? It means that they thought when they were in the city of Tyre, they were completely safe. You know, Tyre was a good posting for a soldier. You know, there was none of the rough and tumble that you had to deal with in other parts of the world. You could go to Tyre and you could hang up your shield, hang up your helmet, and enjoy the benefits of life in the, in the prosperous city of Tyre. No need to worry because it had these magnificent walls that protected her. So much so that even Nebuchadnezzar couldn't bring down the island part of the city. Well, in verses 12 to 15 then, we read of the substance of Tyre. Now, we're not going to take the time to read that this morning, but you can certainly read it when you go home. Uh, time forbids us. But what you have in those verses is a record of the nations with whom Tyre traded and the goods in which they traded. And uh, it's an extensive list of nations underscoring the fact that Tyre was the world trade center of the ancient world. Her contact lists on that particular section of Scripture include Spain, Greece, Armenia, Turkey, Arabia, and Jordan. Some even suggest that Britain is included in that, in that particular listing, uh, and they suggest that Tarshish is a reference to Britain. I don't personally uh, ex uh, believe that, but some people believe that Tarshish is a reference to Britain. I think Tarshish is a reference to Spain, but nevertheless will not fall out of that, out over that. Spain or Britain is still a long way uh, from where they were in Phoenicia, and it tells you something of their reach uh, economically that they were going out into Western Europe 
and they were bringing back goods and exchanging goods along that sea line. So we think of the substance of Tyre, and then in verses 25 through 27, we read of the sinking of Tyre. It says, the ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market, and thou wast replenished, and made very glorious in the midst of the seas. Thy roars hath brought thee into great waters, the east wind hath broken thee in the midst of the seas. Thy riches and thy fares, thy merchandise, thy mariners, thy pilots, thy caulkers, and the occupiers of thy merchandise, and all thy men of war that are in thee, and in all thy company which is in the midst of thee, shall fall into the midst of the seas in the day of thy ruin. So we read that the ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market. That's a kind of curious term in the Hebrew. Uh, you know, different scholars deal with that particular term in terms of the linguistics of it. Uh, but they've come to uh, the conclusion here that the ships of Tarshish uh, joined with. You know, if, you, if you're singing, you're usually accompanying somebody, aren't you? You're accompanying something, a piano or something. So the idea is that they accompany the ships of Tyre, that they joined with them in their exploits, and that they were very successful together. They made very glorious in the midst of the sea. And there's the difficult Hebrew term there, that little phrase, they made glorious in the midst of the sea, because it, in the Hebrew it suggests that they were weighed down with goods. They were weighed down. You know, they were, they were so wealthy that they just packed these ships up, absolutely stockpiled them, and the ships were sitting low in the water with the weight of cargo upon them. Now, uh, you and I are not sailors. I think most of us are not sailors here anyway, but I think we understand that when you weigh a ship down like that, when you put a lot of cargo on a ship like that, and you bring down the line of the ship on the water, then you put the ship in a treacherous situation, that there's the greater, greater possibility of the ship being sunk. Of course, we know that in ancient times, they often threw cargo overboard. They threw ballast overboard in order to lighten the load of the ship in a storm and to bring her up out of the water. But these ships were weighted down in the water, and, and as such, they courted disaster. And here's the deal. The more you have, listen to me now carefully, the more you have, the more you have to lose. The more you have, the more you have to lose. And that's where the city of Tyre was. Now, we read that Tyre now faces her very own armada moment. We read that thy rowers, in uh, verse 26, that is their civic leaders and statesmen, have brought thee into great waters, into troubled waters. The east wind hath broken thee in the midst of the seas. Now, the clue there is in the phrase, the east wind, because the east wind is often in Scripture a signal of God's judgment upon a people. Did you realize that? You know, we've been suffering this week with the east wind, haven't we? It's been a bitter, bitter week in terms of the weather. But the east wind was used in, in, as an expression of the bitterness that comes from the wrath of God. When God blows upon you, you're in trouble. Interestingly, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the armada, uh, the Spanish armada, was sunk owing to an east wind that God did blow. It was an east wind that, that wrecked them. And so, in, in the Scripture, you find the east wind again and again referenced as the judgment of God. Psalm 48, 7, Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 17, speaking of Judah, says, I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. You go into the book of Exodus, and you find that the plague of locusts came on an east wind. Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day, and the east wind brought the locusts. Exodus 10, 13. And then in the Exodus itself, as they're crossing the Red Sea, we read the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. 
and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Now, of course, that led to the salvation of Israel, but it led also to the condemnation of Egypt because their, their warriors were sunk in that sea when God uh, withdrew the wind. So the east wind here speaks of an act of God. And when God acts against a people with an east wind, well, we find that all is lost. The more you have, the more there is to lose. Look in verse 27. Thy riches, thy fares, thy merchandise, thy mariners, the pilots, thy caulkers, the occupiers of thy merchandise, all the men of war that are in thee, all thy company which is in the midst of thee shall fall into the midst of the seas in the day of thy ruin. So again, what happens? Nebuchadnezzar comes. He flattens the coastal city. Then 250 years later, Alexander the Great comes. He lifts the debris of the old city, throws it into the sea, creates a causeway and a land bridge so that he can get out at the island city. He's thwarted on a couple of attempts, but he finally makes it and he destroys the island city of, of, uh, of Tyre. And all of that, both the actions of Nebuchadnezzar and the actions of Alexander the Great are viewed in Scripture as an act of God that was predetermined and prophesied in Scripture. Now, prophetically, Tyre points us toward the end of time and points us to the downfall of commercial Babylon. Remember, Tyre was the commercial Babylon of the seas at this point in history, but she's being used here as a type, as a figure pointing toward the very end of time. In Revelation chapter 18, let's look there for a moment, and verses 17 through 19, you'll see very similar language is used between commercial Babylon in that chapter and uh, indeed commercial Tyre, of which we've just read in Ezekiel chapter 27. Revelation chapter 18 and in verse 17, we read of commercial Babylon. For in one hour, uh, well, actually, actually, let's back up a little bit. Let's go to verse 15. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and, and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught, come to nothing. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by the sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour she hath been made desolate. And if you were to look back in Ezekiel chapter 27, you'll see that there was a similar wailing and a similar lamentation made for the city of Tyre. So we have a prophetic truth here, a near truth and a far truth. Remember, we've learned that in Wednesday night in prophecy, there's always a, a, a near truth and a distance truth, a near prophecy and a distant prophecy. So the near prophecy pertains to the city of Tyre itself, but the distant prophecy points to the fall of commercial Babylon at the end of time. But I don't want to go down the prophetic route this morning, because I want you to think about this practically. Now, I'm not saying prophecy isn't practical. It is practical. But I want to think about this from another angle. And uh, I want to think about how practically Ezekiel chapter 27 as a parable shoots, a, uh, shoots a, a, a warning shot across the bow of our lives. You see, it speaks to us of trusting in materialism and in consumerism. Those are the marks of this generation, of this age. And really, if there is ever a warning that says to you, you ought not to rest your life on consumer items. You ought not to rest your life on material things. You ought not to rest your life on financial prosperity. This passage is that telltale passage. But I want you to look now with me in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy in chapter 6. 
1 Timothy chapter 6, and let's begin reading in verse 6, where we read this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now, what a reminder of truth this is in verse 6 there. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment. You cannot overthrow godliness with contentment. You see, the contented man and the contented woman is much to be envied by their neighbors. The man who is at peace with God and peace with himself and peace with his surroundings is the richest man on the planet. Understand that. And here's a shot of reality for us in verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. You know, when you think about it, you came in in nothing but your birthday suit. And you're going to leave in much the same way. You know, Job, we know this well, in Job 121 said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. Solomon said the same thing. If you remember in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 15, as he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and he shall take nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand. He says you came into this world with nothing, and guess what? You're going to leave with nothing. You're going to leave everything that you value behind. And in that being the case, then here's my suggestion to you that whatever you own in this world, that you hold it with a very loose grip because you're going to have to let it go someday. You're going to have to let your nice house go. You're going to have to let your car go. You're going to have to let your nice clothes go. You're going to have to let your electronics go and your gadgets and, and your bank account and all the things that we're tempted to hold on to as if we can somehow bring them with us into eternity. Wasn't that the mistake of the pharaohs? Didn't the pharaohs bury themselves with all their treasures in the hope that they could drag that gold into the afterlife. And of course, what happened? Well, the pharaohs are all lying in, in state, as it were, or all lying in the museums of the world, and their gold is likewise spread around the world today. They didn't take any of it with them into the afterlife. They left it all behind. And so you ought not to be unwilling to let it go. Everything you ho own, hold with a loose grip. Be prepared to let it go. Uh, look in verse 8. It says, In having food and raiment, clothes, let us be there with content. You know, I can't think of a statement that is more countercultural than that statement. Having food and clothes, be content. You got food in your tummy? You got clothes on your back? You got a roof over your head? That's it. That's all you need. Because all you're doing is you're going from A to B, from birth to death. And in between, all you need is food, clothes, and a roof over your head. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is not necessary to your survival. Now, can you imagine, you know, how uh, this kind of attitude would have sat with the ancient Tyrians? If you were to come into that prosperous city and looked around this city that said, well, we're perfect in beauty, that would have shown you the wonders of their architecture and the strength of their fortresses and the power of their military. And they would have said, look at us, look at how brilliant we are. And you said, listen, all you need, fella, is clothes, food, and a roof over your head. 
Can you imagine how those Tyrians would have looked at you? What is wrong with you? This is Tyre. This is the World Trade Center. This is the economic hub of the world. Don't you realize that the streets are paved with gold? But listen, if we bring that into the modern era, can you imagine if everybody was to take verse 8 very seriously, if the whole world took verse 8 very seriously, what would happen to the credit culture of our day? You know, people in the United Kingdom owe 1,692 billion pounds in personal debt. That's by the end of November of last year. 1,692 billion pounds are owed by us and our fellow citizens to the banks of this country. The average UK household is in debt to the tune of 60,720 pounds. The average household. You know, sometimes you're driving by those big homes and you think, man, those people are rich. Those people are in debt. Many times, they're in debt. The average credit card debt for, the, for the, our country per household is £2,100. Now, that's per household. Not every household has a credit card. But that's if you, if, you, if you divide it up into every household, it's £2,000. It's telling you that there are people who have credit card debt who are paying huge amounts of interest on that, who are into debt for thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds, and they're unlikely to crawl out of that debt. And do you know why these figures are so astronomical? They're astronomical because people are never content with what they have. We always want bigger and better and more than we ever had before. And here's the deal with our present generation. Not only do we want bigger and better and more, we want it now. You see, we, when, 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 I, when we were getting married, when Hazel and I were getting married, I'm sure many of you were the same. When you were getting married, here's how it worked. You saved up this unusual thing called savings. You saved up. You put money in the bank. And you saved up something called a deposit. You didn't borrow your deposit. You saved your deposit. And when you had your deposit, you bought a house. And you usually bought a house at the very bottom end of the housing market. You know, the first house we owned cost us the grand sum of 9,000 pounds. It was a little terraced house. You know, tiny. I mean, a bedroom, a, a, a kitchen so small, you could literally put your hand on one wall on this side and the other wall on that side. That's how small our first kitchen was. But you know what? We were as happy as could be with it. We were as happy as you could possibly be living in that house. And, uh, you know, we, we bought that house, and then we spent about a year before we got married trying to fix it up, which was very hard because I hadn't a clue what I was doing. <laughs> and so uh, I was learning DIY as I was going along and doing it very badly, I have to say. Uh, and, you know, we furnished it with secondhand furniture. In fact, a, a few weeks before we were due to get married, we had no furniture. And all we had was the promise of a bed that Hazel's mom and dad were buying us as a wedding present and a suite of furniture that my mom and dad were buying us as a wedding present. And other than that, we had zero furniture in that house. We had somewhere to sit and somewhere to sleep. That was it. And a man came to my mom's house, my mom and dad's house. He knocked our door and he, and he asked for me, one of the neighbors, and he said, I hear you're getting married. And I said, yes, I am. He says, my mother has just passed away. We have a house full of furniture. Would you like it? Would I ever? Yes, please. And so we filled our house with granny's furniture. We didn't have the latest furniture. We weren't down in, in, uh, in, uh, in furniture land signing up to some, some debt or other. We weren't filling our house with the best of everything. But you see, what has happened is we've raised a generation, and I don't know it's necessarily their fault, it's possibly our fault as parents, but we've raised a generation that thinks they ought to have the best of everything now. And so they go up to their necks in debt. And you want to know how bad it is? According to the Office of Budget Responsibility, now that term right there would just bamboozle most young people today, budget responsibility, what does that mean? Uh, the Office of Budget Responsibility said in their November 2020 forecast uh, 
that household debt of all types in this country is forecast to rise to, listen to this eye-watering figure, 2.3 trillion pounds by 2025. In four years, our nation will be in debt to the tune of 2.3 trillion pounds. You say, well, the government won't bail us out. <laughs> the government is in debt. The government is in debt. So understand that on the long run, all of this is totally unsustainable. That after the credit boom, there has to be down the line a credit bust. And, you know, if you've been, unless you've been, you know, had your head in the sand or you've been living in, a, in some kind of isolation over the last year or so, you can't help but notice that every time the Chancellor of the Exchequer steps up to the mic, He's given billions of pounds to these people and billions of pounds to those people and billions of pounds here and billions of pounds there. And you're thinking, where is he getting this stuff? <laughs> you know, a year or so ago, they were telling us, well, we can't afford this and we can't afford that. Now we're giving you billions, 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 billions. He's like the bingo man. But understand, there's a payday coming and our nation has to be heading towards some very choppy waters economically. It doesn't take much movement in the balance of the world economic system for you to find that once that, uh, once that whole environment changes, you are in trouble. You see, it's just the same as personal debt. You may take on a loan today that you can service, but next week you might be out of work. Now that loan's a different story, isn't it? Now it's a burden to you. And at some point, I think what's going to happen, coming to this nation and to other Western nations, is an east wind. That God is going to cause these nations to realize that our trust in finances and materialism and consumerism and commercialism has been misplaced. And when that happens, you know who hurts the most? People who have the most to lose. People who have got the most to lose. You know, if you think back to the recession of 2008, that wasn't very long ago, was it? 13 years ago. If you could think back to that recession, do you remember that in New York, people were throwing themselves off high-rise buildings? I mean, in the broad daylight, people were throwing themselves off. These weren't poor people. These were people who had previously been living at high on the stock market. These were people who had, prior to the recession, plenty of money, who were living a lifestyle that was likely far in excess of anything that you lived or I lived. But having the most to lose, they felt the impact of the recession the most. And when you see that in the Scripture, you see the same thing. You think about Lot. Lot set his eyes upon the plains of Sodom. Why? Because they were well watered. Because he thought that he could be on the make. He thought that there was gain to be had by living in that territory. He thought, well, Sodom was a beautiful city. If you go back even into the book of Ezekiel here, chapter 17, it tells you about the, the beauty and the commerce of the city of Sodom. And Lot was attracted to all of that. But how does it end? It ends when God blows an east wind upon the city, so to speak, and Lot leaves that city and loses his wife and has nothing but his two daughters who have been corrupted by the culture of that city. In effect, he comes out with nothing. You look in the book of Esther, you have Haman, who is climbing the greasy pole to power, who is trying to be the right-hand man to King Azurus, who's determined to put to death the Jews. You get to the end of that book, and that ambitious figure who was so focused on material things and on, 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 on power and this side of eternity, and who thought that he was somebody, you get to the end of the book, and he's hanged on his own gallows, and his sons are hanged on the gallows. He loses everything. You think about the parable the Lord Jesus told in Luke chapter 20 about a certain rich man who enjoyed a bountiful harvest. 
And in Luke chapter 12 and verse 20, we read of this, this man who uh, realized that he'd got this tremendous harvest, didn't know quite what to do with it, was lying in his bed at one night thinking, what am I going to do with all of, the, uh, all of the goods that I have? And he thought to himself, I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger and better. I'll build bigger barns. And I'll fill them all up with the goods that I have harvested. And I'll say to my soul, you know, eat and drink and, and be merry. And God says, what to him? Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. He lost everything. Not only did he lose the goods in his barn, not only did he lose his extended home, but he lost his very soul. And I wonder, is that you rowing into ruin? Because that's where this parabolic ship was in Ezekiel chapter 27. Here it was with all of its grandeur, with, with seals that were made from linen, with decks that were bedecked with ivory, with oak oars and all the rest of it. And they looked at this ship and they thought, why, wow, look at it, it's perfect in beauty. But their, their rowers rowed it into ruin. They were rowing toward the east wind and God destroyed them. Is that you? That's who Lot was. That's who Haman was. That's who the rich fool was. Is that you? Are you trusting in materialism and wealth and financial success and putting your stock in consumerism and believing that the capitalist dream is somehow or other the secret to success in this life? Let me tell you something. It isn't any more than the communist dream is. If you go look in, in uh, 1 Timothy there in verse 6 and verse 10, Paul says a very insightful thing. He says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. What does he mean? It's the root of all evil. You know, every one of the Ten Commandments, when you think about it, every single one of the commandments can be broken because of money. Everyone has been broken because of money. You know, people have made a god out of money, haven't they? They've made an idol out of money. There are people, even now, who, Christians, who work on the Lord's day rather than coming to church. Now, I'm not talking about people who must work by necessity. There are people in medicine and people in the fire service and the police and so on who must work. But I'm talking about people who have a choice in the matter. And I'm sorry to say, there are Christians that choose to work on the Lord's day. Why? Because they want the money. They want the money. I'd rather have the money than serve the Lord, than worship Him. There are those who have dishonored their parents because of money. There are people who have murdered their parents because of money. And of course, many people have been murdered as a consequence of greed, and uh, many people, sadly, have, been, uh, have suffered violent deaths because people have, have murdered them for money. You think even in the, in the area of adultery, uh, very often, if you look at those uh, adulterous relationships, there's money at the back of it. Uh, of course, it, you don't have to be a, a you know, brain of Britain to work out that those who steal <laughs> often steal money, and those who covet are obviously, obviously covetous for money. And how many times people lie for financial gain? They lie for money. So Paul says a very insightful thing here when he says that the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money rips up the Ten Commandments. And he says, some have erred from the faith even. He's talking about Christians now. He's not talking about this godless world. He's talking about those who profess Christ. He says, some have erred from the faith. And that, that word erred there means to become a hopeless dupe in the grip of a merciless deception. He said there are some Christians and they've been duped by a merciless deception. They have been sold a pup. They have bought into a lie that their secret to happiness lies in your possessions. If you think that money is the answer to all your problems, let me tell you something, you're very foolish indeed. Very often a lot of money is the beginning of your problems. And interestingly, in this epistle, when Paul refers to those who err from the faith earlier on, he refers to them as having made shipwreck. 
He said, having made shipwreck, just like the Tyrians of old. You see, if you are sold out to worldly success, you are rowing into ruin. That's where you're going. You're rowing into ruin. So what are we to do? Well, 1 Timothy 6 tells us three words that you should look at and underline in this passage. The word flee, the word follow, the word fight. The word fight. Look, it says here in verse 11, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. Flee what things? The love of money. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, and fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. He says, flee these things. Flee the envy and the greed that characterizes this world. Flee covetousness after the things of this world. Flee the silly notion that money and materialism is the root source of satisfaction. Leave behind the worldly mantras of success. Remember, as Jesus said before he told the parable of the rich fool, a man's life consisteth not of the abundance of things which he possesseth. He says that's not the secret to life. Flee. Follow. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Like people in the world pursue silver and gold, you and I are to pursue other goals. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. We're to pursue those things that reflect the Spirit of Christ. And then he says, fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Now, he's not speaking here about a military fight. He's using the word fight here as in a prize fight, as in an athletic struggle. And what he's telling us is, is this. There's a prize for us. There are two, pri two kinds of prizes that you can try to attain onto in this world. You can try to go for those which are material and temporal, or you can go for those which are spiritual and eternal. And Paul says, of those two, you should lay hold on eternity. Lay hold on eternal life. He's not telling them to be saved. He's not telling Timothy to be saved. He's already saved. He's telling him, listen, you need to plan for eternity in your conduct, in your worldview, in your spirit. He says, realize that when you get through life, you lose everything you own except those things which are eternal. And only that comes with you. Well, are you fleeing this morning? Are you following? Are you fighting? Or are you rowing to ruin? May God help us to know the difference.